is uh, Bountiful City Council meeting Monday, August 9th, 2021, and it's right on 5 p.m. And council, we're glad to, to see you all. Oh, okay. Oh. Thank you. Yep. And we are glad that uh, everyone is uh, here from the council, and we have a lot of staff here with us. We welcome uh, those who are attending out there. We could actually name them all if we needed to tonight. So anyway, welcome. And we even have a family attending. That's great. Um, let's, uh, uh, we don't have a prayer for tonight, but we'll, let's have a, a Pledge of Allegiance. I'll lead the Pledge of Allegiance. Let's stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Yeah, I might add, you know, uh, that just reminds me of, I didn't get to see a lot of the Olympics, but did, did any of you see the closing ceremonies of the Olympics? It was so impressive. And those, those people who represented the United States, all of them, there was just, you, you're kind of wishing that there was a feeling in our whole country like, like it was there last night. It was just absolutely amazing. It was great. Um, we're going to turn time over to uh, Tyson for uh, our reserve policy discussion. Great. Thanks, Tyson. Thank you, Mayor and members of the City Council. I, I appreciate your time tonight. And tonight is the uh, fourth installment of our, our in-depth discussion on property tax increase and fund balance reserves. And so thank you for your, your time, your consideration, and all the ground or all the legwork that's gone into all of these meetings. So thank you. Thank you seriously for your time. Uh, no one can say that you have not tried to understand this and, and look at this from various different perspectives. So tonight we're, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the city's fund balance and reserve policy. So just a brief outline of what we're going to discuss here and, and what we hope to accomplish. So we're going to look at uh, our current policy in place and, and the specific policy levels and how the policy itself was created. We're going to dive a little bit into comparing uh, the pay-as-you-go financial policy to what, what might be termed a debt financing policy. And then we're going to look to the council to give us some, some feedback as to you know, how, how, how the council feels about the current policy in place and if there's any direction uh, to, to vary from that policy. And then I, I did want to take a little bit of time to discuss the Capital Projects Fund projection spreadsheet. You'll remember that uh, fund spreadsheet that we, we played around with quite a bit in, in one of our work sessions. Wanted to, to touch base back on that for just a brief period of time once we've discussed the reserves policy itself. So the fund balance and reserve policy was originally adopted back on June 16th, 2020, when the council unanimous, unanimously affirmed that vote to approve that policy. So I wanted to just read from the, the, pol the purpose statement within the policy. So th this is actually a part of our, our fund balance and reserve policy. Uh, governmental entities have a responsibility to minimize disruptions to services. Local governments can experience much volatility in their financial stability due to the economy, natural disasters, unfunded legislative mandates, etc. Sound financial management includes the practice and discipline of maintaining adequate reserve funds for known and unknown contingencies. The establishment of prudent financial reserve policies is important to ensure the long-term financial health of Bountiful City and the continuity of its operations. Bountiful City has, a long, has long had a pay-as-you-go philosophy. This balance, fund balance and reserve policy will aid in maintaining sufficient reserves to provide city operations during emergencies and avoid unnecessary debt and expense. So I wanted to read that just to help us all get on the same page of what is the purpose of having a reserve policy? Why, why do we have it? And I think this really goes to the heart of why we have a reserve policy. We've learned very well through this pandemic that there are certain services that are essential and, and Bountiful City provides those services to its residents. We, we, we can't underestimate the importance of what, clean water, of electricity, of good roads, police. We, we can't underestimate these services. They are essential and we have to ensure that 
into the future we are able to provide these services to our residents. And, and that's the real heart of why we have a reserve policy, is to continue these operations well into the future. So how did we create the, the policy that, that we currently have? Uh, a few points. First off, the Government Finance Officers Association, um, the acronym GFOA, as I'll refer to it moving forward, they have a, a plethora of, of best practice documents that we use to help draft our, our current policy. And just wanted to quote one little line from one of the GFOA best practice documents. Uh, so the, in that, that document for capital planning, they said that a government should have a procedure for accumulating necessary capital reserves for both new and replacement per, uh, purchases. So one of the best practices as, as dictated by the Government Finance Officers Association is this, this accumulation of funds and reserves to replace our, our capital items, both to, to purchase new and to replace the, the current ones in, that we have in place. Another, another item that we used in creating this, this policy is our, the City Council priority uh, document that is listed in our budget. And one of those, or two of those policies is that we continue to operate as a pay-as-you-go entity and that we, we maintain a balanced revenue source. So we're, we're trying to follow these, these policies that the, the City Council has identified as, as important policies for the City. Uh, additionally, we, we looked at what the state law requires of us and what accounting practices require of us from a, a fund balance and a reserve perspective. And then we also looked at comparison policies of other local governments uh, that, are, that are throughout the state and, and tried to look at uh, some of the best practices that they've put into their policies. So the, these are some of the, the underlying uh, templates and guide, guides that we use to draft the original policy. So what is our policy for specifically the Capital Projects Fund? And, and it really, that's, that's why we're here tonight, is to talk about the Capital Projects Fund. So our, our policy currently is that we have a $12 million emergency reserve, and then we add to that two average fiscal years of capital expenditures. And, and those are a, a rolling average. So we, we look at the past 10 years of, of capital expenses and we say, all right, let's take the average of those and times that by two to, to get a, a dollar amount for what we want to keep in reserve for capital replacement. So, we're, so for 2020, that, that total ended up being the 12 million emergency reserve plus 10.1 million for capital replacement. And so the total ended up being 22.1 million as our, our minimum uh, target level. Can I just ask a question? Of course. I think um, it feels a little bit misleading when it says plus, um, plus average. For, of two fiscal years. I'm just wondering if we want to change the language so that it, so that it's clear that that is including um, the the 12 million and including the two fiscal years. Yeah, and in I the actual know. yeah, it's a great point. And in the actual policy itself, I'll I'll just read how it how it's worded there. I phrased it differently. Uh, I didn't pull it out exactly. What it says is. At the end of each fiscal year, the city will maintain a reserved portion of unrestricted fund balance equal to or greater than two average fiscal years of capital project fund total expenditures plus 12 million emergency only reserve. So it, it is worded slightly different, but it, it's, a, it's a great point that maybe we could clarify, you know, how, how those two coincide. Just the, the wording, the, the word plus, to me, um, it indicates that it's the two years in it, and then in addition to that, $12 million. And so I think it could be mis misunderstood. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was misunderstood by me. Mm -hmm. But um, so anyway, just, just a point that we might want to consider that language. Yeah, and, and to, to help clarify the point, obviously the, the 12 million emergency reserve can only be used for specific purposes, and then the, the other two average fiscal years could be used for capital replacement. So it's not like we, we can't use that capital reserve. It, it can be used under specific circumstances, um, referring mainly to the large and infrequent capital projects that we have. 
but yes, that, that portion can be used uh, for our ongoing capital needs. Um, well, I shouldn't say ongoing, it's more specific to, to identify large and infrequent capital projects, but it, yes, that, that money can be used more than the 12 million emergency reserve. Mayor and Tyson, can we stop here for just a minute to make sure that we are all understanding this the same way? In my conversations with the public, they do not understand this. They don't understand that we have combined what they would consider a reserve fund with an active spending account. Um, I think in their mind, they think that we've got, we were asking for $22 million in dollars that we will never spend. In reality, what we're, the reserve policy says is $12 million we won't spend, and then we want to keep about $9 million currently that's going to go up and down based upon our capital needs. Um, so I, I think it's, it's, it'd be good to make sure that we all are operating on the same page there. I, I really think that the word plus, it just I'm just wondering if we could change it. Um, to me, I think it would be clearer. And I don't think it's like vital we do it this minute, but I just think, to me, it would be more understandable. Well, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but what is the issue with the word plus? I mean, it's, it's two different amounts being added together. I don't know what, help me understand what the issue is. So the 12 million is included in the two years. It is not included no, not. in the two years. Okay, okay, it's hence the confusion. Amount. Okay, so. So it's 12 million plus two years. So wouldn't that be, um, if, if the fiscal year 2020 was 10 million, wouldn't that be? That, so, w that was the average of two years. Okay, that was so the average of two years. The average, years. it's about $5 million. For, for those two years, it was $5 million per year. So. Okay, so for a total of 22, okay. Well, that helps me, thank you. It really is plus. As long as it really is, then as long as that's descript describing what it is, then that's my question, thank you. Yeah. I have a question for Gary and Tyson. Because this point of having the rainy day fund inside the working capital fund is somewhat confusing, and it's different than say how the state separates their rainy day funds outside of their um, funds, is there a different way that cities would be allowed to set up a, a very specific rainy day fund versus a capital fund that would be something to think about? Not necessarily changing the policy, just changing um, the bank accounts we segregate them into. Yeah. And and just to, to give the, the council just a little bit of the detail in how we do account for these. I, I actually do have two separate general ledger accounts for these. I've got one for the 12 million and I've got one for the capital replacement. So they're separate accounts that we do, we do segregate them and, and keep them separate. But as we're reporting just at the high level, we say, okay, just in general, we're looking at 22 million in reserve. Uh, so it, it's a, the, we can definitely look at uh, maybe keeping them in separate bank accounts. Is, is that kind of what you're getting towards or more just the accounting side? Um, I think it's more, it's more the separate accounts. Um, when I, because in, in my day job, I spend a lot of time at the state legislature. Um, you know, they have, they have their education fund, they have their uh, general fund. Um, they have budgets that are one time and then ongoing, and then they have their rainy day funds, and they have they have the two for um, the general fund, rainy day fund, and the education fund, rainy day fund. Um, but the, there is no working capital necessarily that 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 uh, appears in that big total number at the bottom of the of the rainy day fund, and so uh, I think in the public's mind those are. You know, it's a it's a piggy bank set safely away, um, hands off kind only of only to be you yeah. know, breaking the piggy bank open for one of these uh, dire situations, and so that I, I do think there is the way we are. Uh, while I, I respect that the the accounting um, practices are are keeping them separate on the general ledger, 
I'm just wondering if for uh, visual purposes that it would make more sense to residents if it was in, in a different account and we gave it uh, whatever name the state legislature allows us to call it in the way they let us save funds since they may not let us call it strictly a rainy day account. But that's that was my thought in asking that question. Yeah, I, Tyson, you, you, if, I don't know if you know the answer off the top of your head what they would and what GFOA would or would not allow us to have a fund for if they would allow a city to have a, a rainy day fund specifically or if it has to be included in our capital projects fund, do you know? Yeah, so with our capital project fund specifically, we we couldn't set up a, a sub fund within the capital projects fund. What if we're if we're talking about just reporting to the public, uh, so for instance, if we're looking at our annual financial report, uh, in in that document they do allow us some some latitude in in how we designate the the fund balance section the description of yes it. exactly so we could we could separate out and currently how we how we showed it in 2020 is we did just do one lump sum 22 million um, now that I now okay. you want to pull up the general yeah I do just to just to well, make to sure that session, I'm thinking it so right can we do that just um, yeah let me just quickly pull this up really quick just so I can make sure that I'm telling you the right information. And I nearly brought the giant hard copy with me today. <laughs> and I should have had my hard copy on me. Since we're okay. enjoying this dead airspace, does anyone have any good jokes for today? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here is how we show it on the, the uh, annual financial report itself. So this column right here, uh, two from the left, is our capital projects fund. Here we're actually breaking down the fund balances. So you can see there's our 22.1 million and we call it operating and capital reserves. The, the GFOA do, does allow us to break that out, and so if we wanted to, we could show two lines, one that says 12 million emergency only reserve, and one that says you know, the, the 10 million, 10.1 million capital reserve. So that, if, if that's what you're, you're trying to get to, that's totally within our ability to change. I think that adds uh, a level of transparency and the ability for a regular person to understand what is meant to break it out that way. It doesn't change the amount of money and it doesn't change the purpose of the, of the funds, um, but uh, it, makes it, clearer. it makes it clearer. And, um, you know, while, uh, while I appreciate um, Tyson and Galen's uh, level of proficiency with spreadsheets, not all of us enjoy that level of proficiency <laughs> with spreadsheets, and so the things that help us regular people with spreadsheets are probably good. Yeah. Well, and th this is a great time to discuss this because uh, I'll be creating the 2021 annual financial report here shortly. So, yeah, I, I have no hesitation with that. Uh, Gary, any, any thoughts on breaking that out any further? Only one, only one other thought, which is we're, we're going to want to break it out in such a way that rating agencies will understand how we have reserves and why. And the reason I say that is if we're contemplating um, fiber in the near future um, and are contemplating bonding for that or anything else, to a large degree, the cost of those bonds and therefore the cost that's going to be passed on to the rate payers is going to be based upon the interest rate that we get. The interest rate that we get is going to be determined by the rating agencies. And that bond rating, I should say, will be determined by the rating agencies. They're going to look really closely at both what our reserves are and what our reserve policies are and if we've been following our reserve policies. Um, if they see that we have sufficient funding to back our bonds and that we have a policy and that we've been following our policy, 
we're much more likely to get a favorable bond rating than otherwise. It's one of the reasons that I think maintaining the current policy, especially the first time that it's really coming into play where we have to make a decision is so important because it tells a story to the rating agencies. Not only do we have a policy, but we were willing to do a tax increase to maintain that policy rather than changing the policy, lowering our standards to change to meet our practices. It's a completely different story to the rating agencies, one versus the other, and will dramatically affect the bond rating that we get. Long explanation short, I don't have any problem with what you're suggesting. I think we just want to check and make sure that we're not going to shoot ourselves in the foot with the bond rating agencies on how we display the money. That's all. Great point. Okay, so moving back to the, the reserve it, policy itself. So we've talked about the target level. So that, that's in, in policy currently, that's where our target level is for the capital projects fund. We, we, we really went through a lot of depth in research as to how do we get to these figures. So why, why we suggested the 12 million emergency reserve and then two years of, of capital expenditures, we looked at our, our historical equity positions of the capital projects fund and of the general fund and then the expenditure levels of both of those funds. And, and so we, we really tried to be data driven in, in where we landed in this target reserve so that we, we knew we're, we're basing everything off of what Bountiful historically has done. What, what do we historically spend out of our capital projects fund? And what should we expect for the future based off of that historical trend? We also looked at, uh, just as Gary mentioned, with bond, bond rating agencies. They, they obviously have their own standards of where, where an entity lies as far as a AAA rating or a, a AA minus or whatever the rating might be. And so we looked at, at what the rating agencies uh, consider as good financial practices for reserves. So we looked at that. Uh, the, gen the GFOA also puts out guidance on it, when we're looking at fund balance as a percentage of our overall expenditures, then that, that's something that they also look at and, and give some guidance on. So we, we really tried to be data driven in where we landed as far as the, the reserve target level. So just wanted to throw out just a couple of, of comparison reserve policies that, that we looked at. Utah County uh, said in, says in their policy, the county will maintain at a minimum an amount in the capital projects fund equal to projected cost of capital projects over the next three years as set forth in the county's capital planning policy. So that, that was their, uh, that's their reserve policy is they, they actually shoot for three years of capital projects. Were you able to tell if, um, if they have uh, an emergency only additional fund? It, for Utah County specifically, they did not identify a specific emergency only reserve, so. Okay, thanks. Yep. Uh, in the Alpine School District, they, they actually looked at kind of just a, a generic percentage of their overall capital uh, items. So if you took their balance sheet and you added up all of their, their capital items, they, they said, we'll take 1% of that total and reserve that as our capital reserve. So, so just a couple of uh, comparison policies there. One thing that we did notice is that there aren't a lot of municipalities that have reserve policies in place. And, and with that, they, you know, we, we were kind of limited in saying, okay, let's compare our p policy to theirs. But what I did find is that while they may not have a written formal policy, there are many cities within c that are comparable to Bountiful as far as population goes that, that do keep reserves and, and do so uh, very similar to Bountiful. For instance, I went back and looked at everyone's fiscal year 2020 audited, audited financial statements, and I said, what, if we were to take our general fund and our capital projects fund, add it together, how do we stack up against some comparable cities uh, to Bountiful? So Bountiful's on the left-hand side. We're at 33.7 million uh, between those two funds in 2020. If we looked at Logan, they were at 32.8. Murray was 25.5. Lehigh was 31.9. Draper was 37.1. So you can see that uh, we're not the lowest, we're not the highest, we're, we're kind of in that, that ballpark. So even though they may not have written formal policies, you can see that they actually are in, in the practice 
keeping reserves and trying to keep uh, the, oper the flexibility that a, a financial reserve provides for them. All right, so moving on to, uh, in, unless there are questions, I, I'm just gonna move on to kind of comparing and contrasting a pay-as-you-go financial policy versus more debt-focused. So any questions before I move on to the, the next area? All right, so pay-as-you-go. Just so that we're kind of all on the same page, we're, we're looking at using ongoing revenue streams to fund what we do every year for our operations. We, we pay for uh, routine capital items uh, with our ongoing revenue streams. And then we also try and save away for, for the future with these ongoing revenue streams. And then we only use our reserves when we're looking at larger and frequent capital items. And we, we try to avoid any outside financing as infrequently as possible. Uh, so that would include bonding, lines of credit, short-term loans, those types of things. There, there are even some in it, some municipalities that, that do uh, tax anticipation notes. So before they get their, their tax levy uh, coming in, they, they actually go out and, and bond, or get some financing against that incoming revenue stream. So there, there are lots of different financing options out there, but uh, the pay-as-you-go type philosophy is to try and use those as infrequently as possible. We, we recognize that there are times and important purposes for financing and, and specific times, but we try to avoid that as, as much as possible. The, the idea behind a pay-as-you-go philosophy is we're, we're trying to charge the current residents for the current services we're providing. And the pay-as-you-go philosophy actually does a better job of that and, uh, than, than debt financing. So for instance, we, the, the accounting world calls this interperiod equity, where we're taxing current residents for current services being provided, uh, as opposed to bonding or, or delaying the payment for current services out 20, 30, years into the future. So we, in, in the accounting world, we call that interperiod equity. In some ways, wouldn't you say that, that if, you, if you do bond, like if you bond for 30 years for water pipe, then over those 30 years, the people who are utilizing that water pipe are paying for it, mm -hmm. as opposed to residents who paid 10 years ago that into our reserves, and now we're charging them, we're paying you know? Yeah, and, and the, the tricky part with th this interperiod equity kind of uh, compare and contrast between pay-as-you-go versus debt financing is, you know, if, if one resident pays their property tax bill and then moves right out of the city, uh, then yes, you're right. We, we've, we've overtaxed that specific resident. Uh, so we, we try and look at, the, look at the city as a whole and say, all right, how can we best tax the general residency of Bountiful for the current services that we're providing? And the pay-as-you-go philosophy does a better job of targeting the general uh, residency of Bountiful. Does that make sense? Did I help clarify that? I, I don't know. Okay. So when we're talking about debt financing, we're borrowing, uh, we're, we're borrowing money that is tied against our ongoing revenue streams. And we're, we're using that debt financing for anything that would require the use of, of our reserves. So what are some of the pros and cons of, of both of these philosophies? So under a pay-as-you-go, we're, we're more likely to achieve interperiod equity, as, as I've been discussing. The city also saves all the costs associated with issuing debt. And uh, on, on the flip side, we're also earning interest on those reserves as we're holding them. For instance, in 2020, the Capital Projects Fund specifically earned $613,000 in interest and investment earnings. So it's, it's a significant uh, amount of money that we do earn on our, on our reserves as we're holding them in, in, the, in the case that we don't need to use them at that period, period of time. Yes. Great. Right. Um, would you give us a likely example of what other costs would be associated with issuing a bond? So it's not just the principal and the interest. What other fees or yeah. uh, monies would residents be paying for? So I just jumped to my next slide when we're talking about the cons of debt financing. So I wanted to just highlight the most recent example that Bountiful has of, of debt financing. So that would be our light and power bond that we issued back in 2010. 
So here in, in this bullet, uh, just under the cons, Bountiful City actually, we loaned, we borrowed 15.28 million, and over the time frame that, that we had that bond issued, which was a 10-year period, we paid 416,000 in issuance costs, and that includes everything from our bond council, our municipal advisor, our trustees, the underwriters, the bond insurance, the surety bonds. So uh, there's a lot of people that we pay when we bond, and, so, and that all gets paid out right when the bond gets issued. So we paid 416,000 in that, and then over the 10-year period that we held those bonds, we paid uh, 3.4 million in interest, and I will say, uh, under this next point, we actually paid six million in interest. But because we issued these bonds under the Build America Act uh, back in 2010, we were actually reimbursed by the federal government for 2.5 million of that interest. So that's why I said we, we paid a net interest of 3.4 million. So what the, what the city paid out over holding these bonds for 10 years is basically 3.8 million in, in money to borrow that 15 million. Is that kind of what you were, you were looking for, Richard? It was exactly. I'd, I'd also note for the rest of the council that uh, the city paid, I believe it was $10 million out of reserves for this same purchase. So we'd, we avoided bonding for the entire 25 million because we had a healthy enough fund balance that we could contribute $10 million bond for the $15 million and still have a healthy enough fund balance that we could be fairly confident going forward that we were gonna be okay. Yeah. So we avoided a lot higher fees than this mm -hmm. by contributing that $10 million. Yep. Thanks Tyson, that was perfect. Yeah, thank you. And, and just one, one additional note on that is the, the city did go out to market for these bonds. And so if we had not issued under this Build America Bonds Act, we would have actually been on the hook for the full six million in interest uh, based off of our, our rate that we received from the, bot from the rating agencies. So if, just uh, to give it perspective, over a 10 year period, loaning 15 million, we'd be paying about six million in interest. So a very sizable chunk of loaning that money. So just uh, wanted to go back to some of the, the possible con of, of doing, being a pay-as-you-go entity. We do have to monitor our reserves very carefully, and, and we, we do that so that we can make sure that they're being replenished as, as needed. Because again, uh, we're cyclical in our, our capital projects. We have some years where we pay a lot, and then we have other years where we don't pay as much. In those years where we don't have as many capital expenditures, we need to save for the future. So one of the cons of, of a pay-as-you-go entity is you, you have to monitor your reserves very carefully and make sure that you're replenishing them in the years where you can and you're using them wisely in the years where you're, you're spending. Tyson, if I may, mm -hmm. I would actually qualify that as a pro. <laughs> <laughs> because I think any amount of scrutiny above and beyond to our budget is a good thing. So if that's the only negative, I think that's a win. There is another potential negative, and that is that ever since we moved to Bountiful oh, between 25 and 30 years ago, there's been talk of the secret hoard of money that Bountiful has. And that Bountiful doesn't need money because Bountiful has all this money in the bank. And uh, when, the, when the policy is explained, and folks realize that we're actually paying significantly less for having that money in the bank than we would be if we didn't have it in the bank and we're borrowing to run the city. It makes a big difference to their attitude towards it. It's not money that the city council accesses for personal needs or that Gary Hill gold plates his bathroom with. Uh, it's money that saves residents significant dollars over time. So, thank you. Thank you. So some of the, the pros of debt financing. Uh, it, it is a tool that, that spreads out the payment of a project over many, many years. And, and that's, that's a very valuable tool at times. It, it offers the, the opportunity to continue on with a project when possibly you don't have enough in reserves to, to move forward with the project. So it, it might allow you to continue on a project that you otherwise would not. 
it also it could help in, in an environment like right now where we're in an inflationary economy. So to today's project costs, you know, might be a lot cheaper than the project costs two years down the road. So it sometimes allows you to take uh, action in a year when costs are cheaper. And, and so the, the, the debt financing tool can truly help with that. Tyson? Uh, yes, please. Can I make a comment on mm -hmm. that one? Um, that assumes you have to save for two years in order to pay for the improvement. Right. I mean, that would be the number one argument for bonding versus pay-as-you-go, which is what's least expensive, saving for 10 years and then, bu and then buying it, or uh, going in, buying it now, building it now, and with today's, infl and, and today's um, construction costs, and then paying interest. So in other words, that point is, that, that pro is moot if you already have the money in the bank, right. mm -hmm. um, which is Bountiful's case. Um, so people will argue that, yeah, it's cheaper than saving, but that's only if you don't already have the money in the bank. Yeah, yeah that, I, and thank you, Gary. That's exactly why I put this full cost analysis as the second bullet, because you do have to run the numbers and say, all right, if, if I build today, are the costs cheaper in today than they would be 10, 15 years down the road enough to compensate for the additional interest I'm paying and the origination fees and everything that goes along with, with debt financing? So it's very true. You have to do the full cost analysis of, of the project. So again, we've already talked about the, the cost of debt financing, which is very legitimate and, and something that we, we take very seriously. We also... I, I don't know how much you're, you're familiar with, but we have a lot of regulatory uh, steps that we have to go through whenever we bond. So we, we have to report uh, annually to rating agencies. We have rating agencies come in and do specific reviews over all of our finances. And we, we have to go through arbitrage compliance uh, evaluations at least every five years on every bond. So there's a, a a great amount of work that goes into the compliance aspect of bonding. We also uh, could be looking at reduced financial flexibility. So if we, if we reduce our reserves to the point where we're bonding for every capital project that's, that's large and infrequent, then we really don't have the flexibility to say, we want to move forward with this project, and it is a necessary project. Uh, we want to move forward with it now. We don't have that flexibility anymore. That, that does get taken away. So another thing that I wanted to highlight is debt financing is very different for a for-profit or a private entity than it is for us in government. Let, uh, just to explain that point, if we're looking at things from an IRS perspective, the the for-profit businesses are looking to try and reduce their taxable income. And the, obviously the, the for-profit entities, they, they're, they're trying to pay as little in taxes as they possibly can to the IRS. And some, some of the tax write-offs are interest, interest expense and also depreciation. So if a for-profit business goes out and purchases a capital asset, they're, all, they're able to write off depreciation expense and they're able to write off interest on the loan to purchase that capital asset. So those are two benefits to a for-profit business or entity that is not applicable in the government realm. We don't pay income tax. So we get no benefit for paying interest. We get no benefit for the depreciation expense on our capital assets. So, so one significant difference as to why a, a private sector or a business would actually favor debt financing versus a pay-as-you-go type philosophy. Tyson, is this why then maybe a CPA from a private firm might suggest debt financing? Because there is a benefit in the private sector that they might not be aware doesn't exist in the public sector. Correct. Yep. All right. So we've, we've gone through the high level idea of, of how we created the policy and the details of the target levels and, 
and kind of the pros and cons of, of pay-as-you-go versus debt financing financial policies. So I wanted to open it up now to the council and mayor to, to ask questions. What, what else can we help you understand about this policy? And then once we're done with that, let's, let's discuss whether the council feels comfortable with the current policy in place or whether we want to make any adjustments to it. So, council, any questions to staff? Something that I've been hearing is um, if you have if you have um, a pay-as-you-go system, then you don't have to ask when you make major purchases. But when you but if you if you don't if you you know if you bond or whatever if you borrow then you have to ask, and so there's kind of that check there. So, what are your thoughts on that? Don't, don't we, we as a council ap approve major purchases? So there is an ask and we are the people who are approving it. So if that, I feel that that check, not that I feel, the reality is that check is already in place. Yeah, and one other comment that I would make with that is that cities actually don't have to ask their residents. Uh, as long as you're not doing a general obligation bond, you don't have to go out and get the the public vote on a bond. You can go bond against your sales tax revenue stream. You can bond against your utility revenue streams. You can bond against basically any ongoing revenue stream that the city has without voter approval. So, so the concept that a pay-as-you-go does not get public input versus a, a debt financing, I, I argue that that's a little false because a, a city can go out and bond without voter approval uh, anytime they want, as long as they have enough revenue capacity to, to finance the bond. Gary, could I ask what projects is the city looking at, maybe long-term things that we're going to be needing to pay for? It's a, it's a good and somewhat difficult question. Um, I mean, long term, um, we, have, we still have all of our, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna limit this to the infrastructure related to the capital projects fund. So taxpayer funded, not utility infrastructure, so not water or anything like that. As you know, we have a very large ongoing cost to maintain all of our streets. Um, that was a major point of contention four years ago. Um, we pointed out that we were gonna begin spending more money on streets. We had additional revenue come in from the, the road sales tax, but we've also contributed much more than that from our capital projects fund. Most of our road infrastructure was put in, you know, within the last 30 years. Um, it's all coming due, as you're seeing the, 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 the massive dollar amounts that we're spending. To reconstruct an entire road is about a million dollars a mile, so which is why we avoid doing that like the plague, because it's so expensive. Um, we have all of our capital facilities that we've been building that we have to maintain, um, and that includes ongoing maintenance to all of our buildings. We've seen with this building the problems when you neglect city when you neglect city buildings. Uh, it's our anticipation that we're not going to do that anymore, that we're not going to let our buildings fall into such a state of disrepair that we're going to have to spend major amounts of money and rebuild them or renovate them. But that's going to cost more money than was being paid, you know, say 20 years ago to maintain some of those buildings. Uh, we've added our parks. Um, the parks that we've added are higher maintenance and have a higher replacement value. It's going to be a lot more expensive to replace uh, or repair, say, the water feature at Town Square than it would have been if it was just grass. Um, and and maybe, maybe even more importantly than that is we just, we can't anticipate everything. Um, you know, an allegation has been made that the city has a 10-year capital plan and that it doesn't show the five million dollars on average that we've been four and a half to five million dollars on average that we've been spending for the last 14 years and that we we aren't even following our own projections we've tried to explain to the public that they are just known needs and there are a whole quantity of unknown needs that will come up this isn't a new problem we just did an internal analysis on what the 10-year capital plan looked like back in 2001 for example 
So we went back and looked and saw what was predicted to be spent in 2000 uh, in the 2001 fiscal year. And the administration at that point predicted about $1.2 million, excuse me, I'm gonna get the correct numbers. I don't, I don't wanna misspeak here. Um, but it was the same issue of, well, how, you know, if you're making projections, shouldn't that be all you expect to spend in the future? Um, Gary, can I jump in and say that that's what is more comfortable to me about our policy than the one that you read from the school district, Tyson. I, I think that it's uh, much more informative to have a policy that looks back at what has been spent as well as looking ahead, but to base the policy on what has been spent rather than just on what the next three years are scheduled to be spent. So, Yeah, the capital back in 2000, the, the, the city and the administration made an estimate that in 2001 they would spend $3.4 million. Just one, in 2001 they actually spent $8.8 .8 million. So they overspent their estimate by $5.4 million. Then in that same plan they had estimated in 2002 they would only spend 2.2. They ended up spending 5.59. They overestimate, they underestimated their expenditures again by 3.3. Now the next year they underestimated them by two. The next year, excuse me, they overestimated them by two million. But in 2004, they underestimated them by two. It is so hard to predict what's going to be a need going out into the future. We do our best job that we can, and I know the administration back then did too, to identify what the known needs would be but you don't know if we're gonna have a colossal rainstorm and we're suddenly gonna to have to replace, you know, uh, a block's worth of sidewalk and a gutter on 18th South like just happened. You, you can't anticipate the floods of 83. You can't anticipate the um, financial downturn that happened or, or the, uh, the, the power crisis that happened in 2000 that ended up the city needing to subsidize the power fund to the tune of 14 or $15 million. Um, so, I, that's, a, that's a longer answer, Chris, than maybe you're looking for, but I, th I think it is a fallacy for anyone to suggest that we can read the future and, and assume what our expenditures are going to be. We do the best job we can, but the past is a much better predictor of the future. Chris, to, if, to Richard's oh, I'm point. Sorry, excuse me. Gary. Um, three things. I think I'm glad that you pointed out that actual historical data is much more reliable than projected numbers because I think anyone who has had their own business or dealt with the budget knows that things come up, un unforeseen circumstances come up, and thank you for explaining that. And I think there's this understanding that this fund reserve policy is new. And correct me if I'm wrong, but hasn't there been one on the book since 1982 and this was updating it? Yeah, there's, there has been a fund reserve policy for decades. Yes, ours, and so ours we were is changing an it. Yes. We were updating it to be correct with the current climate, economic climate. And so this isn't a new policy or a new um, way of operating as far as Bountiful is concerned. And if, if I could ask, um, you touched on the power crisis. Could you go into a little bit of detail for that, just for people who may be listening in, just because I think that's worthy to note how valuable our reserves were at that time. Because usually yeah. it's the opposite. Usually we're doing a draw on the power fund, not a draw, the fund, well, I'll let you explain it because yeah. you can explain it better than I can. Well, I'll, I'll start there. So for those who might be you know, keeping score at home, <laughs> for, for decades and decades, 10% um, of metered sales revenues have been transferred to the general fund. Um, that is essentially taking a dividend from the, the power fund and using it to keep property taxes low, which has worked really well. In about 2000, um, there was a major spike in fuel costs, and um, we were buying quite a bit of our natural gas and quite a bit of our energy off of the market as opposed to generating our own power. In the course of nine months, 
um, we spent $10 million in reserves. Most of that was spent in three months as power rates went from buying on average about, I wanna say about seven cents per kilowatt hour to 70 to 80 cents per kilowatt hour. It just decimated um, the power fund. Over the course of the next couple of years, we, were op we had uh, about $160,000 in the bank for a $50 million, $40 million operation. Um, I mean, that's, that's very scary. So for the course of the next couple of years, there were some transfers from the general fund reserves to the power fund to help keep it stable. One of those included, and, and this is notable, one of those included a one million, just over $1 million transfer of funds from the Capital Projects Fund to the Power Fund in exchange for the Power Fund taking away all of the costs and ownership of the streetlights. Normally, the streetlights of a city get paid out of the Capital Projects Fund. Well, a deal was struck so that the Power Fund would get a million dollars, but then they would have, from then on, have to take care of the streetlights. Had that not taken place, the general fund would now be paying to replace all the street lights that we had to instead institute a $2 million or a $2 per month fee for on our power bills to replace the um, street lights. So that was another way that we kept that. And then a few years later, when we did this, when we did this financing, in order to make ourselves less prone to these market fluctuations, the city decided to invest in some gas-powered turbines. Um, we were able to transfer $10 million back to the power fund to help, as we has been pointed out, to help buy down the cost of those. Um, that has resulted in a much healthier power fund um, overall. I mean, we are much better off financially and we're much better off re reliability-wise, but none of that would have been possible without a healthy, capital projects fund. So would you say it's um, reasonable to say that had we not had such a healthy reserve, we would have potentially lost the power department and all the benefits that that offers our city? Well, I, th I think it, I think it, would, it would have been, been a, significantly impacted if, in the long term. I think that the council would have had to make a really hard choice. I think they would have had to, to make a major increase to power rates. Mm -hmm. um, or property or, taxes. Or property taxes, or they would have had to um, consider doing away with the, the, the power department altogether, which some cities did. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are cities that in the last decade have sold their power utilities to Rocky Mountain Power. Um, but in all likelihood, it would have been a, a dramatic increase in rates power rates. Thank you. Can you tell, um, can you tell us about insurance um, that we have for, in place for the city? I mean, I know that we're self-insured in many ways, but we also have insurance. So can you just tell us about those policies? Sure. This is more Galen and Clint's bailiwick. Who wants, who wants to draw the, the straw? Galen looks like he's ready. He's locked I'm and loaded. Ready if you would like. Why don't you talk about what our limits are and what that covers? Okay. Uh, we are a self-insured um, entity for most things. We have a what we call a self-insured retention amount, which is basically a deductible. And uh, that is uh, $250,000. And uh, that is for uh, covering liability costs. So we have an excess policy that covers um, our... Um, exposures there and it's divided out into various things for covering uh, police liability or general liability semi slips and falls or something like that um, and we also have a um, first dollar coverage uh, property policy so we have a blanket coverage for all of our buildings that we have and um, things that are similar to that and uh, that is covered uh, with a deductible separately on that and then we have policies that cover uh, various other things like cyber liability, uh, workers' compensation, which is partly self-insured as well, with an excess policy that takes care of that. And um, we have commercial crime coverage and a few other things that are just blanketing all of what we have as exposures that way. 
And then the other insurance that we have is related to employee coverages, which is a separate policy and, and program. Is that kind of what you're after there? Yeah, I was just wondering if there was any coverages we have that would protect against things like an energy price spike or you know, anything like that? That would be business interruption coverage and we have elected not to do that. Uh, there's been some entities uh, that do have a minor amount of that. It, it comes into play really well if you're in a um, kind of like, a, uh, well, the rec center, for instance, I think they have a small amount of coverage for that, but they're in the business of uh, having a transaction with a customer or regular like that, uh, rather than a city that's primarily uh, focused away from that and just through taxation services and that type of thing. It's not to say you can't do it, but we don't. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions from the council to staff? Comments? Mayor, I don't have a question, but I've got maybe a couple of comments. Please. Which is completely out of character for me. Yeah. So yeah. I hope Unusual. you'll indulge me. Unusual thanks, Richard. So over the time uh, that I've been on the council, I can seriously say that having the reserve policy and the pay-as-you-go policy has saved residents many millions of dollars. And to think that we can abandon our reserve policy or change it significantly or save residents money by not increasing taxes right now, to me is really short-sighted because if we do that, residents are going to pay a lot more over time. I mean, it, it really is a long game for most of us. I, I don't think any of us here are ready to check out. But any changes I think that should be made to the policy have to be data-driven. And, and the historical data that staff has provided and the review of this policy in the packet today has been, has been comforting to me, knowing that we did adopt the right policy that it does stay with Bountiful's historical precedent of living within our means, paying as we go, in saving residents money by having cash on hand to do the things that need to be done. I mean, the lower fees that residents are paying, and, and by the way, we're saving money for residents not in the city's coffers. We're saving residents money in their own pockets through our lower taxes and fees. These are funds that people are keeping every year because we're one of the lowest taxes and fees cities in Utah. If we, if we get rid of that, if we decide to join the pack of the other folks who are borrowing for their projects and who aren't maintaining healthy reserves and who have abandoned the idea of having the money on hand to pay for things, that it's going to cost residents more out of their pocket over time. There's not gonna be this mysterious vault of money at Bountiful City, but residents will seriously be paying more over time and. And if we do it like this, it's gonna be a fairly short period of time. So I'd, I'd encourage all of the council to take the long view of this and understand that the policy saves people money over time, significant money over time. And if we abandon the policy, people are, are, are gonna be happy for a vote and we might get cheers on a vote, but in the long term, they're gonna be paying a lot more money for what we have to do for them. So that's my comment. Thank you, Richard. Other comments? Um, I just want to ask about the, I know that there are reserves for the um, enterprise funds. You know, they have their reserves. So um, maybe we could just get an overview of those. Yeah, sure. The So again, the, the policy is comprehensive in the in the fact that we're we're not it's it's a policy that's that's for enterprise funds it's for the general fund it's for the capital projects fund so it is comprehensive so the the policy for enterprise funds specifically calls out that we're looking to keep a 6 month operating reserve and then we're also looking to keep 1 year of capital projects for that specific enterprise fund. So for instance, we take the light and power fund. They, they, they would keep six months of operating expenses, which would include anything from personnel services to operations and maintenance supplies, uh, those types of costs, six months of those. And then we, we look at the past 10 years of their expenditures from capital perspective, and we take one averaged year of, of those past 10. So that, that's the target reserve for all of our capital projects funds, or excuse me, for all of our enterprise funds. 
is that uh, kind of where you wanted to yeah. dive into? It, it begs the question, the policies are slightly different, right, between the capital projects fund and every other fund. So every other fund, it's six months of operating plus one year of capital. The capital projects fund is $12 million plus two years of capital. Why the difference? Um, the answer is, again, looking historically at what we've historically had. For the 10 years before I came to Bountiful, the average balance in the capital projects fund was $24 million with a peak of $33 million. What our current policy would say is less than that. We were saying we should have a minimum of about, right now, about 22, about 22 million. That, that historical piece and basing our decisions not only on best practices but what um, Bountiful's actually been doing for years is really important. Um, and so, you know, for some people to suggest that that this is a new practice is incorrect. If, and if they're suggesting that our balances are too high now, then they're also saying that they were too high for the last 10 years. Um, some people may believe that, um, but, but as your staff, we don't. Um, we, we think we're being prudent. I, I may just, if I may, if I may before there are other questions, I, um, I have come to understand in the last couple of weeks that people really do not understand what we mean when we talk about reserves. I don't blame the public for criticizing something that they don't understand. But I think you all ought to recognize that you're gonna hear criticism because people do not understand. They're not criticizing things because they have a complete understanding. They're, it's based on a limited understanding. And this, these are people who, one in particular that I know that that's currently serves on some of our boards and commissions, serves on other governmental boards and commissions, very smart person who just had a misunderstanding. When, they, when, when the general public hears reserves, they think a bank account that won't be touched. We know it's not that. We know that we're talking about part of it is money that won't be touched plus money that, we, that ebbs and flows as we spend it. And the general public doesn't understand that. And so I, I and, and we have racked our brains on how to better explain that over and over. And, and as you know, even based on this conversation, it's, it's challenging. But I, I wouldn't want you to overreact that the public is frustrated by our fund reserve policy because their frustration isn't based in fact, it's based in misunderstanding. And I don't blame them for that. It's, but at some point you sort of have to trust the professionals. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Uh, any other questions or comments? I have some comments. I don't want to preclude anyone from that still has some questions. But cool. if we're to that point, if no one else has questions. No, it's fine, Kate. Okay. Um, I think first off, I'd like to say I appreciate the time, that the extra time that our staff took to find um, examples and comparisons. When we had this discussion earlier in the year about the reserve policy, um, I felt good about the reserve policy and I felt like the, the principles we were using to describe the policy made sense. Um, but no policy should ever be above asking more questions at any point. So I've appreciated um, uh, the residents and the others that have wanted to ask questions and looking at some of these other local governments I think was helpful and instructive to see what their policies were um, and then how ours matched. Um, and I think this is a good exercise of as other philosophies on reserve policies come up, I don't ever want to be afraid to look at them, that um, I'm not the smartest person in the room and so I'm willing to hear the person who is the smartest in the room um, give us some advice and then weigh that against you know what we've we've been doing and compare why that makes some sense um, I will never have in my personal checking account as much money as the city budget um, it's off by several zeros to what I compare in my life but it's what I've got it's the experience I have and so I usually try and break these things down just to my basic um, budget for for my little household and when in thinking about the pay as you go versus um, taking on debt to pay for things, um, I thought a lot about a very recent project at my house 
my husband and I finished our basement, um, which is something you know a lot of families do over the course of their lives. And uh, when we decided to take on that project, um, we looked at what we could afford with what we'd saved versus doing a, a home equity line of credit. And we decided, though it would take us longer, it actually took us three summers for the listening audience. My husband's a teacher, so summers are a critical building time in our, <laughs> in our life cycle. Um, we decided that rather than take on the extra debt, we would utilize the three summers because my husband could do some of the work and then the things we weren't qualified or capable about or would lead to um, uh, couch style uh, sleeping arrangement disagreements we would pay for someone to do. And so we did that over the course of three summers to finish the basement. Um, and ultimately, we were able to do that without taking on any debt because we paid as we went. And I personally feel like I, um, I won some of those design battles uh, and was able to pick the finishes I wanted um, that maybe cost a little bit more because we were doing it in that pay-as-you-go um, method. And that worked out really well for us. I think there is a place for debt um, but I have felt, particularly as we've been in this unsettled time, that uh, I've been glad that we did not have that as something weighing us down as a family um, when who knew early on in the pandemic how things would, would fare. Um, I've also thought a lot about kind of the criticism of trying to project our needs in the capital fund versus um, what actually happens in life. And again, this is something we apply in, in, our, in our family budget. Um, we had planned um, in 19 and 20 to replace some carpet in our home. We needed to put new tires uh, on, on uh, one of the cars. And those were kind of known and planned expenses. Um, things that weren't planned. In a 18 month period, I ended up having four surgeries, just me, um, not including <laughs> anything that happened to anyone else in the household. Four unplanned surgeries, uh, one was pretty major. And um, we also, our hot water heater decided to leak and the dishwasher broke. Um, on top of that, the rest of the planet decided to have like a pandemic and an earthquake and a windstorm. Um, but those were our personal financial tragedies. And it it is it has taken a, a while in our um, married life and budget situation to save up money so that we have those reserves. Um, but we were able to weather all of those unplanned things in, in that time period because we had those reserves. There were definitely periods of our life coming out of college where, where those reserves would not have been there, but we'd reached a point where we had those, and so those weren't kind of devastating, catastrophic instances in, in my personal life to have those, um, those expenses come up, um, to have those reserves. And having only served for a short amount of time as we've kind of had these different things that have come up, you know, a wildfire that came up, a windstorm, um, different times. There was a water main that broke near uh, my home twice on 4th North um, that was a pretty major repair. I, I've appreciated that we can do our best to plan as a city and that sometimes these other things, forces of, of nature, um, national or international things will come up and we, we can't always be perfect. Um, I think the exercise of trying to forecast is incredibly important. I think the look back to make sure that should we adjust how we plan based on you know what our expenses might have been the prior year is important. Um, the fact that we've had reserves to weather those things is, is uh, no credit to me because I haven't served long enough. Those were all policies put in place by people that um, served long ago and and um, we're thoughtful about putting those things aside. So I remain comfortable with our reserve policy as, as it's currently drafted. Um, I'm not opposed to continuing to poke at it and see if it still stands up to, um, to the, the principles and the reasons why it's in place so that we can have these um, things that allow us to have the flexibility take on debt when something is necessary, whether it's an emergency or something that is on a, a short-term option for us to take advantage of. Um, but I'm glad that we will always have that flexibility by having a, a robust reserve policy and um, you know, look forward to continued best efforts to plan 
knowing that um, after what we've survived the last 18 months or so, um, be hard not to be better prepared going forward for all those types of expenses. Thanks, Kate. Well, well said. I think that that's. I think you answered a question. Are you to the point where you, you, with your agenda that you're wanting to, to hear how comfortable people are with where we are, and certainly Kate began that. Uh, Chris, I would really go to you and ask you if you're comfortable where we are now. You know, I was thinking. I, <clears throat> I was born during World War II, and I remember as a child, um, my mother had a little jar that she kept sugar in because sugar was rationed. And she would take from that jar and she would take a little sugar out and put on our cereal. And we had a little boy neighbor that came over one day that had breakfast with us. And mother put sugar from the reserve sugar bowl. And he said to my mother, What's that? They didn't have sugar. They didn't have sugar. And so I've always appreciated my parents, and I appreciate this city because my father taught me, you pay as you go. If you don't have it, you don't buy it. And you don't go in debt. When we came to the city, and I had the opportunity to spend some time with Mayor Cushing, I remember the first words that he said to me about why he loved this city was it's a pay-as-we-go city. And that hit me right in my heart because that's the way I believe. Um, I have the opportunity of giving lectures to dentists around the country. I am surprised at the debt that so many dentists are in, overwhelming debt, and they'll never get out of it. They'll never get out of it. But the wonderful thing about this city is we are a pay-as-you-go city I know we can't look to the future, but we can look to the past to help us in the future. And I think that's what Gary made very plain to me, and I appreciate that, because that's what I was hoping to get at, <laughs> is that, that we cannot prophesy what's going to happen in the future, but we do know what's happened in the past. And I think that's very, very important. So I'm very comfortable, and I told Tyson more than once, I appreciate him for explaining it in such a way that a children's dentist can understand it. That's perfect. That's perfect. So I appreciate Tyson. I appreciate the way he explained it, and I'm fully supportive of this. Thank, thank you, Mayor. Thank, thanks, Chris. Candle and please. Um, I think it's, I think it's a really good policy, and I appreciate your, your months and years actually of, of working on this. So, um, the one thing I would say is that it does seem like the. The formula that we're using, which I don't know of a better one, but the formula we're using for the Capital Projects Fund, over the last years, um, our expenditures for things like Town Square and things like that, I think are more and unusual, um, some of those expenditures. And so I don't know, you know, I, I don't know a better way, but um, I don't know that that's the best indicator of of moving into the future, what we're spending over the next few years. But um, I do think it's a good policy. I, I appreciate your work very much. Thanks, Kendall. And Millie. Thanks, Mayor. Um, to echo what everyone else has said, I think I, I supported the policy when we, when we first voted on it, and I support it now. And I think we need to be mature enough to realize that, unfortunately, we can't please or pacify everyone. I wish we could, um, but that isn't our job. Our job is to analyze real data and not opinions and to make those decisions accordingly. And unfortunately, sometimes the wisest decisions aren't always the most popular but that doesn't mean we should abandon historical data and something that has served Bountiful well for 40 years. Is that appropriate, do you think? 20, 40 years at least? Um, and to, just as we go into Wednesday's decision, 
I think it's important that this policy that my three colleagues have already said that they support says that in that policy um, that if we do ever get off trajectory, we will bring the policy back or we will bring the reserve fund back into balance within five years. And that is what our proposed tax increase does with the numbers as they currently stand. So I think it's important that we stay the course to support this policy that Councilwoman Harris, Simonson, and Bradshaw have already indicated that they support. And I just think I'm very happy that we have a policy that puts our residents in a good, and our city in a good position economically that will save our residents money in the long run and that will help them hold on to their more money in the long run. So I'm in full support. Thanks, Nellie. Sir Richard. Um, I just want to say that, first of all, I've, I've never heard a council colleague look at our fund balance and say, wow, we've got a lot of money. What projects could we spend it on? I've never heard that before. And I think that in talking to residents, and I've, I've had uh, plenty of neighbors uh, visit with me about the potential tax increase and express their uh, concern about how much the council has spent recently, and even had a couple of people talk about the fact that the money is uh, burning a hole in the council's pocket, our reserve funds. And frankly, I'm very proud of the projects that we've done I think that the projects that we've done have been uh, in response directly to residents' requests and the priorities that have been listed on the uh, surveys that have been done. Uh, I don't think that, uh, I don't think anybody in this council is, is interested in uh, holding more funds than is prudent or in taxing residents more than is prudent. But I would just caution us again to avoid the, uh, the easy applause and to look long term at this and realize that even if we don't do it now, abandoning the philosophy and not taking on ourselves the responsibility that we have committed to do to keep the city in financial health is going to cost our residents significantly more down the road. Even if this full increase is adopted, Bountiful is still going to remain one of the lowest taxes and fees city in Utah. We're that low. So I, I'm not saying we should raise taxes and try to be average. I'm not saying that we should uh, tax even one dollar more than is necessary. But I think that we've got to take our responsibility seriously to keep the city healthy so that residents keep more of their money in their own pockets. That's me. I love this policy. I would marry it. I would marry it. Thanks, Richard. That's very romantic. Hey, so... Um, uh, let me say, you know, th when I go to a COG meeting, and that's all 15, that's all 15 mayors in Davis County, um, we sometimes just talk before. We have, always have a little, we always have a little uh, dinner, depending on which city we go to, but they always talk and say, well, t tell us about your council, or how, how do you get along with your council, or those kinds of questions, and I've, for, for eight years, I've really said the same thing to them. I just say, I think Bountiful's been uh, really fortunate to have uh, smart and mature uh, council members. They're, uh, and some of them will ask me, well, how much time do you spend with them? And I, I tell them I don't spend a lot of time with the council. I don't spend a lot of time at lunches and stuff, and maybe that'd be better if, if, if I did. But I, I remember somebody asking me when they gave me a responsibility, uh, a leadership responsibility once, and I asked them um, what they wanted me to do. Uh, how did you want me to act? They just said, just, just be a leader that I don't have to worry about. And uh, I've always taken that to heart. Just be, uh, be someone that uh, your employee doesn't have to worry about. It's nice if you have children that you don't have to worry about. It's nice for a mayor not to have council people that they have to worry about. 
So I just think we're really privileged to have you. And then, and then you've asked really good questions. And I think it. I think this whole thing with taxes and that. I think it. It, it makes us all kind of bear down a little bit to what's real. It makes us work a little harder. Uh, makes us think a little deeper. And I really appreciate our staff, and I know I can speak for each one of you, that through this process the last month or so, they've dug down deeper. <laughs> when they come, they always have more answers for us. Historical data, things that we can really use, you know, that'll, that really kind of help us all in what we're trying to accomplish. And so I, I can't say enough about the staff and all of you doing it. I mean, we really have... We really have a, a, a really great team here, and uh, I hope that answers the question for you. I really support, I support what you folks do. You're, you're really smart, by the way. It's really good. I like it. Um, anything else? If not, I would look for a motion to adjourn. There is one more item oh, there, I'm sorry. if that's okay. Oh, please. Yes. <laughs> thank, well, and, and I just want to say thank you. Uh, I, I truly appreciate your support of the policy. It's, it's, been, it's been a lot of work and effort to, to draft a policy that fits our needs, and, and I truly believe that it does fit Bountiful's needs. And we're, we're of course, always open to suggestions and, and forward-looking, and what other implementations could we add that would benefit the city? Obviously, that's always something we want to look at, but truly appreciate your support. And I, as the finance director of Bountiful City, I, I'm ecstatic that we have this policy in place. It is something that will benefit residents well into the future, so thank you. So being totally facetious here, now that we've discussed being a pay-as-you-go entity, let's talk about bonding. Um, so you'll, you'll remember, and this is just to, to help preface the council for Wednesday night. So this is uh, the spreadsheet that projects out the capital project fund balance well into the future. And you'll remember this well from all of our work sessions where we plugged and played and, and looked at different scenarios. A, a resident brought up a point that, that was, was well taken, that our previous model did not include the reimbursement of the $8 million that we're looking to spend on Washington and Washington Park and the trails. So the $8 million bond that was passed by the, the residents uh, in the, the November vote, the, the previous model did not include that $8 million reimbursement, although it did include the, the expenditures. So I wanted to, in full disclosure, come back before the council and discuss how that affects the model. So if we plug in the additional $8 million in cash that we'll receive when we bond, what does that look like? How does that affect the fund balance of the capital projects fund? So again, want to make sure that we give you all the data so that you know exactly how to, how to make the vote on Wednesday night. So you'll remember that this blue line is plotting out the actual fund balance of the capital projects fund. So here we are in 2020. This is what the audited number was at, $29.8 million. We go to 2021 where we estimate we'll end, then where we estimate we're going to, with, based off of the budget, where we'll end in 2022. So assuming that we, we issue the bond in 2023 and we get the full $8 million reimbursement, that projects us back up to a fund balance of $25.5 million. So you can see that without any property tax increases uh, plotted in, in the tra trajectory, we would end up in the very next fiscal year, we'd be back in, in this realm of being below or at our minimum fund balance policy. And, and just to give you uh, an idea of what I've changed from the, the previous model that we, we looked at and discussed to this model, all, all that I've done is I in, added that $8 million increase for the bond reimbursement, and then I also actually ran the numbers on what our minimum reserve would look like into the future. And, and based off of our, our average capital expenditures, what that minimum reserve would look like. So again, we, without any tax increase, 
we would we'd bump back up to 25.5 million in 2023 with the reimbursement, but then immediately we're we're looking back at the declining balance because again we're we're concerned about the negative financial trend that we've been seeing over the past 14 fiscal years, where our expenditures in the capital projects fund exceed our sales tax into the capital projects fund, and and so we've not done anything to correct that negative trend unless we do something about that. So a one-time influx of $8 million does bring our fund balance back up above the minimum reserve level. But without correcting that negative financial trend, we see that immediately we start to go back down. So just to, to plug in the 950,000 that's proposed of a, a tax increase. So that in, in the projection throws us back up to 27.4 million, which I might add is lower than where we were in 2020. Uh, so again, we're not skyrocketing our, our cash reserves. We're, we're just getting back into the realm of where we feel comfortable, where, where we've historically had our, our fund balances. So we get us back up to that point, And again, we, we start to see the slow decline, uh, but it does keep us above the minimum reserve. So the, the 950,000 proposed is, is enough to get us up above that minimum reserve level. So we're not, uh, again, triggering that five-year replacement cycle that we've talked about. So I wanted to bring this back to the council and, and see if there are any specific questions that you have about this. And, and again, want to be totally transparent in this. Let, let you see all the data. I, in my original model, I did not include the $8 million reimbursement. And the, when I was building that model, we had not, as a staff, we had not discussed when we would bond. And, and I did not know when that $8 million might come back into the city. So I did not include it into the projected revenues. But full transparency, here it is. What questions do you have for me or for Gary or anyone else? So I want to make sure I understand your spreadsheet uh, graph correctly. So. In fiscal year 2021, you're showing $8 million of expenses, which helps drive the blue line down, correct? Uh, between 2021 and 2022. For, I'm assuming you're talking about the $8 for, million in Washington yeah, and for trails. Yeah, for the trails and for Washington Elementary. Yep. So you've, you've shown in the, in, uh, in the lead up the expense and then the repayment to the bond. So, we, so we are then sitting at essentially a neutral point from the from the prospect of uh, ex monies coming in to cover those expenses and monies going back out for the those two things. Correct. Another way, to, another way to, you could look at that would be to take both the eight million revenue and expenditure out and see what that does to our fund balance. It would have the same effect it would put us below the reserve policy and does, does it make sense why that's the case no whether or not you have the eight million in there or not because the, we're still not contributing enough every year to the fund balance and that's that's what the tax increases to help it just t changes the timeline rather than the trajectory exactly I think that it would be accurate to say, though, that unless we have fairly regular increases to our property tax, we're always going to see that glide path, that downward slope yeah. over time. Yeah, and I think I, that's you fair know, to say. It, it depends on what the council has an appetite for, but to me, I'd rather take care of the problem now and then see a number of years getting back to that uh, decision again. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'll admit that I have changed my uh, mind over time that uh, I thought maybe if we got residents used to the idea of having regular property tax increases that it would be more comfortable for us, but uh, I've changed my mind. It should be uncomfortable for us, but we shouldn't be afraid to take it on. So thank you. Other questions? Yeah. It gives me hope that maybe we don't need a tax increase when I see that. It makes me think, I mean, I think we should, we should have a tax increase when we need one, and so maybe we don't need one until fiscal year 2023.
but the problem is is that the issue is here now and we can't put this burden on future councils when there's five of us here who have this data who have all unanimously now twice said that we support this policy that is in place and so if we're going to support this policy in place and to Gary's point earlier of keeping our bank accounts healthy so if we ever do need to bond <coughs> we can have a lower interest rate I feel that the wise course of action is to follow again the policy that we have all said now twice that we support so Tyson now that you've broken out uh, my favorite graphing tool <laughs> and work sessions are to do the work and uh, and see what different things mean if we plug in different numbers um, I, I am curious what, uh, you know, what dollar total or percentage would um, put us on a, on a glide path from 2020, fiscal year 2023 forward to more closely mirror our reserve policy line. I'm guessing it's something less than 950 and, but not zero. So just to throw some numbers in there that keeps us above that minimum reserve line, is that what you're looking for? Yeah, I, I, am, I am genuinely curious what helps us follow that trend line closer, staying above it, but follow it so that it's not, um, you're not building, you know, the mountains behind us. Yeah, any, any specific uh, starting spot well, for, for 2022? Eight, 800,000. What does that dollar amount look like? But we need to keep in mind that five-year mark, correct? Yeah. So once we once we dip into the reserves, uh, we do that does trigger that five-year replacement, um, which has us needing to hit it in fiscal year 2027. Uh, looking looking like so the orange line is our minimum reserve. So we dip into it in fiscal year 2022. Mm -hmm. And the policy says within five years oh, we need to right. have a plan. Yes, thank you. Which yep. would be, I mean, math isn't my strong suit, <laughs> but. Yep. Okay, well, just for fun, since unless someone else wants to play with the spreadsheet, uh, what does 750 look like? Oh, I got to get the right number of zeros in there. <laughs> Don't let me monopolize the fun spreadsheet. <laughs> it's all you. And one one just consideration that we we need to keep in mind is we're I, we're again looking at a minimum target. Uh, so that orange line is by policy our minimum. It, it does not by any means say this is a comfortable reserve for us. Uh, so just, just keep in mind that, yes, it, it gets us out of the replenishment cycle, but we do need to keep in mind that on average we're spending $4.5 out of our capital projects fund. And if we continue that trend, we, we again start to dip into our reserves far more than we would like. that you've got up there in orange? Yes. What is the, is that the annual expenditure that you've estimated? Yeah, so 4. what I've 5. done, yeah, so the, I started here in 2020 with what we actually, what I actually calculated. So 2020 is the 12 million in emergency only reserve plus the two fiscal years of capital. And that is the, the actual past 10 years of average capital expenses. So, so that's that number. I then said, okay, if we roll that number forward into 2021 with what we expect to pay out in 2021 for capital, what does that number look like? And, and then I just proceeded on. And I, after 2023, I just said, all right, let's use our 4.5 million average expenditure as, as the number. So that's where these numbers have come from way out into the future. And, and I will admit that I did not build in an inflation factor. So we actually might, I, I might actually be a little conservative on these numbers by, by 
a bit uh, understating the expenditure a little bit, but that's that's how I came up with that that orange line. And I guess we can always hope that there aren't uh, unforeseen uh, costs that have to come from that fund, and maybe that orange line can have a nice glide path as well. But in all sincerity, we've got to be prepared for anything that could come, including a, a, a power crisis or a market manipulation that impacts us like it did so severely, and be ready to handle it. Well, and hopefully, I mean, it's, it should be some comfort to the council that, and the public that, you know, we're not, we're not talking about duplicating even the peaks that we've seen in the past. You know, if, if, we, if that was our goal, we would be looking at $33 million as, as a peak. This doesn't get us anywhere near that. Um, if you wanted to be really comfortable, that's what we would be shooting for, right, is something closer to an average peak as opposed to an average minimum. Um, and we're not suggesting that. And that was really the whole point of the reserve policy, if you remember two years ago, was where, what is enough and um, so that we weren't over collecting or under collecting. And, um, you know, it's, that's, that was the genesis of that whole conversation. I, I apologize, I have to go, but this is such a good discussion. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kendall. Um, any any other questions or comments, uh, Kate? Tyson brought out the spreadsheet. <laughs> no. Oh, we're done now. It's addictive. It's, it's a it's a it's a fun tool. Um, Tyson, I know you can get Kate for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> it's in her inbox just, already. Just build so. me a pivot table. Yeah. Uh, be great. I want to make sure I understood this point. So the orange line is a conservative um, reserve fund policy target uh, estimate without inflation built in. Um, you are using in the assumptions our historical uh, totals, which have exceeded our projections, correct? By exceeding our projections, I, I exceeding our our um, if we budgeted um, for five million dollars of planned expenses when we have had unplanned expense expenses that would show up in our historical data mm -hmm. that 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 our those average expenditures then have some of that they um, do squishiness. Yeah. Is that, is it, that yeah, an accounting term that you accept, squishiness? <laughs> I, I like it. Okay. Hey, hey, Kate, if I, is, is, this, is this, was this what Gary was talking about, Gary, when you were talking about, back about uh, 2000, 2001, that the projection was like two, but then it was really eight, uh, eight million. Yes. On, I mean, the, that they used, that they actually used from the projected fund. I mean, the unplanned hot water heater. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yes. <laughs> Kate, that, that was the only point I was just trying to make. Yeah. Is that some of those things. And so that's the average recently. Is that? The, the average of the past 14 fiscal years is 4.5 million. Okay. okay. Yep. Thanks. Kate, back to you. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. So, so. You know, I'd be willing to accept that, that the orange line is a minimum threshold. Um, it's a, probably a very good indicator in the first maybe two fiscal years, but after that, your model starts to get squishy right. because yep. we won't we won't be basing it on historical data. We're now basing it on a projection on a projection on a projection. Yep. Um, so in that first at this at this current uh, proposed tax increase amount in the in fiscal year. 23 and 24, it feels like you have enough squish for the hot water heater uh, unplanned scenario, to my mind. But in six, you know, in in 2025 and 2026, it starts to get thinner. So could you show me again 800? I feel like this is like Alex. I'll take tax increase for 800, please. <laughs> Okay, so we still are fairly, uh, we don't have very much flex in, in those um, farther out years. Right. And just, just because you have the spreadsheet and unless somebody else wants to make a motion to adjourn, 
and stop with this exercise. <laughs> can I see 850, and then can you show me 900 and then 950? I just want to watch it as it moves. There's your 850. Let's do it in twenty-five dollar increments. <laughs> <laughs> do it one dollar at a time, please. I just. <laughs> All right, thank you. I found that instructive. I don't know if anyone else did, but I did. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Kate. Uh, any anyone else? Any other any other comments? Can I just opine one more time, Mayor? Please, please, please I, Richard. I I feel like it was a collective thing, but I know that I personally, when sitting in meetings with our city staff, who are amazing, by the way, gave them my word that yes, we were going to be asking a lot of them to plan and build and, and complete and maintain some amazing projects. And I sat across the table from staff and I gave them my word that we weren't going to leave them hanging, doing more and more with less and less. But when the time was right, I would step up and explain to residents that this is necessary to maintain what we've done to maintain the quality of life we have here, to maintain the city's financial health, which again in the long run is going to save them money. And I don't know what the disconnect is between what I thought had been a group decision and a group commitment and, and then just declaring after seeing the same numbers, but I don't see that we need a tax increase. So I don't, I don't want to talk ill about anybody who's now not here to defend herself, but I feel like that was a group thing, that we, that we gave our word, that we were going to step up when the time was right, and that we would take responsibility for maintaining the health of the city's finances. So that's all. Thanks, Richard. What are you looking for, Tyson? Uh, nothing at this point. Do you have what you need? I do. Thank you. So, so I was a little preemptive before, but can I look for a, for an adjournment? Move to adjourn. I wanted to do that. Okay. Oh, well, please, Chris. I take the, I withdraw the motion. You withdraw. Mayor, Mayor, I move that we adjourn to our homes. Nice. And a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I thought maybe Kate would say to the mountains on my bike or something.